someone has already done and is already doing what you want to do. And no, they didn't fall into a rich family to do so. They were not born lucky. You know you can be more. You can have more. Do more. And be more. You know this. You wouldn't be listening otherwise. And welcome back to another episode of Key Factors Podcast, Real Estate AF, and the AF stands for and finance. And I'm your host, Mark Jones, and we are powered by ReviewMyMortgage.com, the largest index of mortgage programs in the nation. Um, and lately, uh, guys, we have been gaining some traction on YouTube. I want to quickly throw that up on the screen if you could, JC. Um, we are just under 6,000 subscribers. I made the announcement of hitting 5,000 subscribers at the beginning of last week. So that's a thousand new listeners, um, in less than a week. I'm super proud of that. And as mentioned in previous episodes, I did not intend to do this to make money, anything like that. This is more so, um, cheaper than therapy. <laughs> so without, uh, going too far in depth into my situation here with the podcast, I want want to introduce a guest. Um, and this guest, gosh, I looked up to, I think he's a great dude and also a military veteran who specializes in VA loans. So without further ado, let me introduce John Hurd of the John Hurd team. Thanks, What's happening? Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Heck yeah, man. This is a cool setup you guys got here. Not bad, huh? Yeah. We've come a long way. We started with cell phones and worked our way up. Didn't want to, um, spend a lot of money because we weren't making any money. We still aren't technically. This is just to showcase other experts in the industry to uh, give you a platform and, and showcase everything that you can give to the listeners. So that being said, we're going to be talking about VA loans, uh, myths and misnomers that are out there in the industry. You may see them on social media, things of that nature. Um, but we've got a couple of things to do before we get started. So the first thing, Mr. John Hurd brought us a fresh new bottle of Don Julio, and uh, we are definitely going to hit that right now. Uh just in celebration of my birthday and John's birthday. So today is the 18th that we're recording this. It's my birthday. And then tomorrow is John Hurd's birthday. So in celebration of that, cheers, my friend. Happy birthday, brother. Happy birthday to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's smooth. That's to real kill. smooth. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's not tequila. Yeah, that's just tequila. I like it. I think that's what tequila should taste like. Right? Amen. Yeah. Very smooth. <laughs> okay. So now that we're warmed up, <laughs> John, tell us about yourself, man. Uh, tell us, uh, what did you do before you got into mortgage? Before I got into mortgage, I've been a San Antonio resident nearly my whole life. Okay. Uh, you know, grew up, went to Alamo Heights High School, class of 96, went straight into the Marines right after that. Okay. And uh, did my service uh, with the Marines. I got out, uh, went to school. I went to Trinity. Okay. And uh, so I've been here just about my whole life, except for my time in the military. And uh, once I uh, wrapped up school, I thought I wanted to be an options trader. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Derivative securities fascinated me. I, yeah, man. It is a fascinating <laughs> uh, sector for sure. And um, uh, around that time, Lehman Brothers was recruiting, and I was kind of excited because they were the largest uh, investment banking firm in the in the world. Okay. Um, and uh, it was a mortgage recruiter for Lehman Brothers. Uh, you remember Aurora? Yeah. I don't know if you were, Aurora was a wholesale lender back then. <clears throat> and they kind of basically showed me what I could possibly make in the mortgage side of things versus starting out in options. Okay. And so I was like, okay, I'll learn mortgages. Right. And, uh, it, it kind of spun from there. And so I, I worked, I worked in mortgages ever since. Holy cow. Uh, <clears throat> so you've been in mortgage for what now? 15 years or so? <clears throat> uh, I think going on 19, now. 19 years. Okay. Very good. Dang. You got a couple of <laughs> years on me, a couple of years on me. And, and it definitely shows, man, you know, your stuff. And I know when we worked together back at, uh, directions, um, I saw you as somebody that was upper echelon, somebody that always gave it to your customers straight, gave it to your colleagues straight. And that is something that I resonated and, and related to because I'm the same way in regards to no sugar coating. Let's not come up with a, a way that we can tell the customer around what the truth is. Just give them the truth, set the right, uh, right expectations. Right. Um, and it has done a good, uh, a fair amount of good for you, your family, and your team. 
Truly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I like to under promise and over deliver. Yeah. It's kind of vice versa. There's, there's so many people out there that try to over hype and oversell yeah. and then they can't end up delivering. It's true. And, uh, and, and that's not my MO. Yeah. I mean, in this, in this space of mortgage, we've got a, a lot of new to the business loan officers that um, don't quite yet know all the guidelines and ins and outs of mortgage loans. And there, there are a lot. The reason why I jumped into mortgage was I was fascinated with being an attorney. And when I went through um, all the real estate classes, it was like, eh, this is not for me. When I jumped over to the mortgage side, it's like, whoa, guidelines, regulations, all these things and different programs with their nuances. I felt like I was like a mini attorney yeah. going to find the the way to help my customer succeed in, in their journey. You know, um, yeah. it felt really good. And that's why I've continued and, and done a great job. And I'm sure you as well. Yeah. So in your military background mm -hmm. with mortgage, would you say that there's any correlation or anything that you have brought from being a Marine going into mortgage? Is there any type of, how do I say it? Um, have you pulled any of the traits that you not necessarily learned, but went through into the mortgage side of things? I would say willingness to get the job done. Okay. You know, uh, when I set, when I set out to, to do something, uh, you can ask my wife, you can ask my friends, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to find a way it's going to get done. Absolutely. You know, so I, I think that's a big part of the Marine culture, right? Uh, you know, the, the Marines, you know, they have a, they kind of have a motto. It's, you know, mission accomplishment above all else. I like that. Right. And so, uh, actually I think they even place it above troop, above troop welfare. Okay. Okay. <laughs> mission accomplishment is the number one thing. And so when I set my mind to, to do something, I want to do it. Right. If I tell this customer, Hey, we can help you. Mm -hmm. We're going to help them. Yeah. Right. No matter what. I definitely agree with that. Um, and, and with you, I believe that you work with your wife, Norma. How difficult is that? Because I, I work with my wife, but on a completely different side of things, she's on the real estate insurance side. I'm on the mortgage side. Um, I met my wife at a bank where, that we both worked at. So um, productive, but not very productive at the same time. <laughs> Um, how does, how does that work for you guys? It works good. Cause we kind of separate ourselves from each other. Okay. She has a, a different style, um, than myself, of course. Yeah. And so she does things her way and then, you know, I can kind of do things my way. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we have a, a daughter and so sometimes she's, you know, that takes a lot of her time. Sure. And so sometimes if she gets a client or a lead, um, they ask the client if it's okay, if the, if I help them and, yeah. and Never has there been a time that said, no, your husband can't help me. Yeah. Um, the only really time is if they're a, a complete Spanish speaker. Okay. Right? And Norma excels at that because that's her first language. That's right. But but other than that, we kind of separate ourselves a little bit on this is your stuff. And, and you know, once a file goes into processing, then maybe I'll I'll back it up, you know, and I'll help push it along. And Absolutely. Keep, keep it moving. But. But yeah, other than that, we kind of, we kind of separate ourselves a little bit. On yeah. The guard, so. It makes sense. Um, and I do want to eventually talk about today's market and what's going on, um, what you're seeing out there. Um, and we'll, we'll save that for the end, but, uh, I think we can get into this concept of VA loans and what, um, consumers are seeing, what they're faced with, um, and what, misinformation is out there. Uh, there's a lot of things that, in my opinion, are myths that are being spread um, and unknowing to the person that's spreading it. It's affecting veterans, their ability to qualify, and more importantly, their ability or want desire to move forward with even utilizing their VA benefits to build an empire, so to speak, you yeah. know? Um, so that being the case, I mean, you, you, you do quite a few of VA loans. I do. Um, yeah. you, you know your ins and outs of that. Uh, most of them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, I tell you what, one thing that is very certain in our industry is change. And it, it's there are things that are always constantly changing. The VA loan guidelines is one of them that we've got to kind of stay on our toes to make sure that, oh, did that change? Similar to what was it last year, the year before that, uh, they changed the VA funding fee. And right. it was like, okay, this this might be for the better. Oh, man, it went up. And you're like, okay, well, let's just articulate it or, or educate our borrowers to let them know that, hey, if you want to put some money down, we can shrink this VA fee, funding fee, et cetera. 
Um, but there's, I've got a list of myths that I want to go over and just kind of chat about each one of them. Um, and hopefully by way of this discussion, there's veterans out there that can either get off of the fence, have a better understanding of what they could possibly, um, not necessarily qualify for, but, uh, what they're, what they're currently able, able to do with their VA benefits, you know? Um, so the first one on here is VA loans are only for veterans. And when I, uh, when I read that at first, I went, wait a minute. Yes, they are. Oh, this is kind of a gotcha moment. Do you know why they're not only for veterans? I can take a stab at it. Go for it. Well, uh, you know, a spouse can it, be on a VA loan. That's true. Right. And, and a spouse might not have served. It's true. Um, so, uh, you can have a, uh, a surviving spouse. Um, I'm trying to think of the other matter examples. of fact, I'm doing a surviving spouse right now. Um, and, and that, uh, her husband who has passed away did not die during battle or anything like that. But when he passed away, they were able to tie it back to something that originated in sure. while he was uh, in the military. Connected to his disability. That's right. Absolutely. Um, so just like me, I think you're having the same uh, conundrum. I'm going, wait a minute. And yes, it is. I totally forgot active duty members are yeah. not veterans yet. They're active duty. So they right. absolutely can utilize their VA loan. Absolutely. Um, but when I read this, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yes, it is veterans. <laughs> oh, duh. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and some of the guides for that matter of fact, maybe I can look that up here. JC, if you could throw on the screen, um, let's see here. How long does, does it take a veteran to earn their COE. Uh, COE to get a VA loan. And there are a bunch of different qualifications. It's like 90 hours for this. And I, okay, so here we go. Online application, mail and application. Da, 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 da. Maybe I should have been more specific. How long does a veteran or active duty member have to serve to obtain uh, their VA entitlements. For some reason, I'm thinking like two years active duty time. I think it's like 180 days of war time or so. there we go. Okay, here we go. So for those of you listening, um, that are wondering, uh, how do I get my VA entitlements? We've got it right here for you. We've got 24 months of continuous active. Duty there you go for active duty members. So, uh, between world war two. Okay. So this may or may not still pertain to anybody. This top line that I'm, uh, highlighting here, uh, that was 90 days of active wartime. And then you've got Gulf war, which is just like John said, two years, um, at least 90 days. And I believe that's if you're active duty or, or out, uh, what do they call that? Um, deployed. In deployment. Mm -hmm. uh, then during peacetime, it is 181 days of continuous active duty. Current service members or cur current service requirements, and this was after September 7th of 1980. Uh, let's see here. 24 months continuous active duty. So you're correct on that for sure. And then National Guard. This is one that I get quite often, and it... I. Anytime somebody says I'm in the National Guard, I slow down a bit because at times they believe that they already have their entitlements. Um, and this one's kind of nuanced. Uh, and this is at least six years in service, uh, but they also can get called to active duty uh, for a certain period of time sure. and earn them that way. Sure. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's just – those of you out there, there's many different ways to earn your certificate of eligibility, and that's what we refer to as a COE. That's what we're looking for in order to gain those entitlements. Um, so let's go to the next one here. We've got, you can use a VA loan only once. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Not true. Not at true all. at all, right? No. Tell us more about it. So the VA gives uh, every qualified veteran a certain amount of entitlement, mm -hmm. right? And you can use that entitlement to buy one, uh, two, and and now with the entitlement increase, with the loan limit increases, uh, sometimes three now. Um, once you pay off a VA loan, your entitlement's restored, and you can use that over and over and over again. So there there is really no limit. I like that. Yeah. I mean, and that's something that is a huge myth because I've got current homeowners that 
will come to me and say, uh, I've got to use the conventional loan or can we use this other type of loan? And my first question is, I'm looking at your credit report. And you've got a VA loan right now. What, why, why would you want to do that? Well, I can only use my VA loan once. Well, guys, you can also utilize your bonus entitlements. And just like John said, with the new increase of those limits in the past, just about every time you utilize those bonus entitlements, you had to put down 25% of the difference of the sales price or the loan amount and your entitlements amount. Right. And now with that increase, chances are you won't have to put anything down in, in using those uh, uh, bonus entitlements. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I've got a guy right now that is buying, he owns a home for 300000 and he's getting ready to start investing mm -hmm. and came to me and said, hey, um, how and shout out will i know you might be watching this uh chances are that he wanted to leverage that entitlements buy himself a duplex live in one of the units and rent out the other one yeah. to start and then rent the current that he was already in he asked me is that possible i said why not if that's what your mo that's what your motivation is yeah who's to tell you otherwise exactly you've got the entitlements so he sends me the property and it's $490,000. And I went, oh man, we might need a down payment. Plug it into the equation that we use. Right. Sure enough, no money down. Um, so surprise to him and surprise to me, because like we said, things change, you know? Absolutely. Uh, it's pretty cool. So let's see here. Let's go on to the next one. VA loans have high interest rates. And this is something that I, I do hear quite often. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Throughout my 19 years in mortgage, most of the time they've been lower than conventional mm -hmm. um, uh, because they have a built-in uh, guarantee from the VA. So the, the VA is not an actual lender. It's a loan type. The VA is actually guaranteeing 25% of that loan. The banks are the ones that are doing the lending, right? That's right. VA. So, so uh, it's a safe investment for the banks when they have a 25% of that loan mm -hmm. guaranteed. Um, and so because of that, VA rates are typically a little bit lower because they do represent a little bit less risk. Correct. So, Correct. Um, there was a little bit of a time, I would say last year, where you saw conventional rates uh, in VA neck and neck, maybe an eighth of a point lower on a conventional, but but we've since corrected and now VA is, is, is firmly below conventional rates right now. Definitely. Um, and, and there is a loan called a text vet loan, ladies and gentlemen, that I like to use as a benchmark for the rest of the market. So when you've got somebody, let's say you're shopping around for mortgages and you've got some bank representative that says, yes, today the mortgage rates are five and a quarter. And you're like, wait a minute, everywhere else is at 7%, six and a half percent. How is that right? Um, one thing I like to do, and JC, if you want to throw the reference up one more time, I'm going to go to this thing, text vet. TVLB. Oh, there you go. T TVLB. TVLB.org. Boom. We're going to pull that. Oh, nope. I probably typed in text vet loan rates. Boom. And it's going to be that one right there. Boop. And we're going to go to home loans. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's sitting at a 6.4% rate, and that is their posted rate. This changes weekly. Um, and then if you are a veteran with more than 30% disability, you get 0.5 or a half a point off of that rate. So your rate would actually be a 5.9. So if there are lenders out there, that are offering you way less than this right here, chances are you're going to be paying a substantial amount of points. Yes. Um, and that is any time in the market because this kind of keeps up with what's going on in the market. Um, I, I mean, it's stand pretty, pretty accurate throughout my career thus far. Now, not every lender offers it, but at least you know kind of where the basis is for what someone's offering you in regards to your mortgage financing. Right. Um, so... Yeah, higher rates is something that um, is all relative, in my opinion. We are seeing rates all over the place. Different mortgage companies are pulling the lever up and down, depending on their month and uh, uh, overhead and production, et cetera. Um, because let's face it, that's how we make money in our industry. We don't do this for free. Um, but at the same time, we want our customers to have the best if they possibly can. Um, so it, it's a tough one. And, and those of you out there shopping for mortgage rates, I, I mean, 
you got to find a trusted advisor that you know will uh, give you the accurate information. They're not there. Uh, now, mind you, we don't make any extra money charging you more or a higher interest rate on a loan. That hands down, that changed uh, before I got in the mortgage business. John, you know what? Let's take a pause. What was that like back in the day? Because you you were in the business at the time when you were able to charge more for the rate just based on their credit score, things of that nature. Um, I got in in 2012. Yeah. So it was it had already changed. And I would have veterans come into me like, man, if you were in the business back in the day, you'd be retired. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, how? I don't know any different, if that makes sense. What was that like? It was good and bad mm -hmm. in a way. Some people took advantage of it. Oh, for sure. Which are why some of the rules. Um, those of us that, you know, uh, you know, try to adhere to the golden rule, right? Treat, yes. Treat others yes. as you wish to be treated, right? Um, you give them a, a fair rate um, or, you know, something that you would take or you would offer your your friends and family. Sure. Um, and so, um, yeah, there were some bad apples. But, yeah, you could actually select almost any rate you want and and whatever the, the, the yield spread premium was, you would split with with your bank. Wow. Um, yeah. And so were there people that would take advantage of that or maybe push somebody for, that would easily qualify for a conventional loan into an FHA because there might be more revenue? Mm. There was some of that. And and uh, fortunately, I think a lot of those people got out. I, I was going to say the same. The, the, yeah. the new rules. And. and from what I have gathered over the many years that I've been doing this is the talk about prior to these changes, most, if not all of the loan officers that were taking advantage of customers are no longer in the business. And I believe it, it has a lot to do with the adaptation of how do you do business the right way versus how do you do business that only benefits you as the loan officer. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, but ethics is a huge thing in our industry and it can be a little still to this day, but yeah. you know, um, you, you, we cannot be paid on interest rate. We mm -hmm. cannot be paid on loan program. Right. Period. And end of story. We're, we're pretty much, uh, uh, our, our compensation is based off loan amount. That's right. That's it. I, and I like that change. I mean, I don't I know any different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know any different. Um, so let's see the next one here you need a perfect credit score in order to get a va loan is that true absolutely not why is no. that well technically and i and i don't like when other people say that the va doesn't have a minimum credit score right but, but they don't right. um but the va is also not lending the money boom i was right i was getting ready to write it down but you just said it good <laughs> so the va doesn't make uh doesn't have a credit score requirement but the banks are the ones lending the money. So the banks are going to come in and say, okay, well, our minimum, one bank might say my minimum is 580 mm -hmm. or another bank might say my minimum 600. So to answer your question, no, we don't, you don't need a perfect credit score for a VA loan. However, the, the banks will imply some kind of standard for as far as credit score to let you participate with the VA with them. Right. And I mean, well put. And I want to kind of break that, what you're saying down for the listeners in almost a layman, because that was beautifully articulated. On our side of the tracks, when it comes to that scenario, you've got a, um, uh, how, do, how do we call it? It's a investor that is purchasing these loans. They're more times than not lending the money to the banks or lending the money to the originator so that they can originate that loan according to their guidelines. And then they end up buying that loan. The VA and John mentioned it a, a bit ago. They don't actually do loans. They don't, they, they are the ones that guarantee 25% of that loan in itself. Um, but they're not the ones lending the money. So when it comes to the VA guidelines, no, the VA guidelines don't even require a minimum credit score in order to get a VA loan. But the person that's loaning you that money, guarantee there's going to be some minimum credit score requirement, whether it be 580, 620, whatever the case, and they can set those own parameters uh, for their institution. And typically they're called overlays. Um, so when you hear the term overlay, not orale, overlay, <laughs> Um, that, that's just kind of what we use lingo wise in the industry to say, you've got additional layers that, uh, in order to sell this loan, you've got to meet before that investor will purchase it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now that we've gotten through that, let's see here. VA loans take too long to process. Um, what are your thoughts on that? 
I don't know why they would take anything any longer than an FHA or conventional. Same here. Uh, I mean, that is a myth that I hear quite often uh, from listing agents that will call me and say, hey, I've got your approval letter here. uh, And it shows that they're using a VA loan. Have they considered going conventionally? And my response to them quite often is... No, not at all, because the VA loan is the best loan for them. Um, if you'd like to fill my shoes, come on over and and, and sit in the seat. But um, as of right now, if you'd like to accept the offer, this these are the terms. Uh, get with the buyer's agent so that you guys can hammer that out. But right. on our side, we've got a solid veteran who served their country and they're wanting to buy your home. <laughs> right. No. <laughs> you know. So th- there's a there's been a lot of misnomers, um, and I've actually had in the last probably month, I've had three veterans not get their offers accepted because they were using VA financing, which was, which that was really, me, man. really frustrating yeah. that, that, you know, uh, you have somebody who has taken the time and served his country honorably, earned this benefit, and then just to try to buy a home using his benefit. And the seller says no, because mm-hmm. he was been given bad information, maybe by the listing agent, or maybe he read it online, whatever the case. Yeah. But there, there, you know, some of the the misnomers are, you know, there's a lot of uh, non-allowable fees that Correct. a bank might charge that that the seller would have to pick up, um, and that's generally not the case unless we're talking about a super small loan amount, generally maybe under a, maybe a hundred hundred and forty thousand, right. which is well below the average uh, the loan, and it's such a nominal fee that. Uh, most lenders will pick it up and or maybe split it with uh, the buyer's agent and because it, it's it's not a big it's not a, a a a large sum of money but it doesn't apply in ninety five percent right. of the purchase transactions. Uh, another misnomer would be like the they're they're too. Re- strict on the appraisals. Right. And, and, and then generally they are not, um, I, I haven't had a lot of issues with the VA appraisals. There are some caveats that they look for maybe Correct. so more so than a, on a conventional loan, but they're not very many of them. That's right. Um, so like wood rot, they don't like wood rot. They, you know, they want you to, you know, sand it and paint it. So their, you know, termites can't get in there and stuff like that. That's right. Um, they generally want it to conform to the neighborhood and they want to make sure there's no health or safety issues similar to just about every other appraisal out there. That's exactly right. And I'm glad you you mentioned that because a lot of folks out there believe that conventional is the same as cash when it comes to an appraisal. And that is not the case. Um, I think the overall goal in an appraiser, uh, two things, and you can correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm missing anything, but number one, does it adhere to the value of the other properties around the area in recent time, typically six month period? Number two, is the home safe and livable? Is there anything that is going to cause this new homeowner to go, okay, I can't live here anymore because it's not safe, thus putting the lender or investor at risk of foreclosing? Um, Other than that, yes, there are little things like if the house should have a water heater, put the damn water heater in there. Uh, If there is a missing window, you got to have a window. Right. Um, and I hear it quite often. Yeah, well, there, there, uh, there's some wood rot or there's, um, floorboards missing on the stairs leading up to the master bedroom. We need to go conventional. Eh, you're still going to get those requirements on an appraisal from an appraiser Absolutely. that says, Hey guys, <laughs> yeah. this doesn't fly. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if there's, if there's wires hanging out of the ceiling from a ceiling fan, that's not there, no longer there, you're going to get flagged on a conventional appraisal too. Right? Absolutely. Uh, that's a, that's a safety issue, right? Yep. If, you, if you have a, uh, electrical panel that has, you know, wire shooting out of it or spark shooting out of it. Right. You're going to get called for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, um, and then the last thing when it comes to appraisals and VA and misconceptions is VA appraisals are always short. In my opinion, they've actually been the higher ones that come in um, simply because most of the time they have closing costs that they're contributing. And that veteran typically is a veteran appraiser. Um, number one in their their trade and their craft of being an appraiser for a while, certified to do VA loans, but most of the time they're also veterans themselves. Um, that in itself is something that they're they're looking out for the veteran. They don't want to put them in a situation to where they're upside down in their house right. more than the funding fee that you get to roll into the loan. Right. No, absolutely. I think I think most uh, VA appraisers want to do what's best for the veteran, and you know. Uh, they, they, like you said, they don't want to put them in a situation, and we've seen it before, oh, where yeah. where the uh, both of the agents are pushing the envelope, you know, hard mm-hmm. on on value. It's true, and, and there's absolutely nothing 
no comps to support that value. And they're like, well, if somebody's willing to pay it, that's what it's worth. Mm, yes and no. <laughs> that's exactly. <laughs> Not to a lender. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead and elaborate on that because I think this is something that, uh, number one, we can probably clip out and make you a badass reel or something <laughs> because, uh, the idea behind, um, what's happening in our market on appraisals and once the appraisal comes back short from a lender's perspective and then from a buyer and uh, I'm sorry, buyer's agent perspective and listing agent's perspective, what I've seen too much of is the buyer's agent fighting for the sellers to get this price that they can't really, um, justify based on the comparables. Um, what drives me insane is when a realtor, and I'm going to say it, realtor comes to us and says, this appraiser sucks. They don't know what they're doing. This thing should appraise $20,000 more, but instead it's $20,000 short. Instant response. What is your response typically? Do you have any comps to support your value? Boom. Where are the comps? Because before you took this listing, before you put it out there, I'm hoping that you ran comps to make sure that this wasn't a hope and a prayer or what the seller believed it was worth based on their feelings um, of how much they've put into it and the memories that they've had. And, oh, yeah, we put a hundred thousand dollar pool, so we should get a hundred thousand more back. It's just not the case. Right. I mean, but go it's going to happen on a conventional as well. You know, I had a situation, uh, I don't know, several months ago where, uh, you know, a VA appraisal came in $30,000 mm -hmm. short. Um, we kind of got a heads up by the appraiser ahead of time before he finished his report. And we asked for some uh, additional comps from the mm -hmm. listing agent and, and possibly the buyer's agent. Well, they, the comps that they had sent me, I, I looked this up in MLS and, and the comps they sent me just were not comps. They were the highest priced sales in the neighborhood, they all had extensive upgrades where mm -hmm. our subject did not, you know, and and there was just no way to use those as comps. And in reading the appraisal report, that appraiser tried to get as much value as he could. That's right. Um, but at the end of the day, the the comps that they were supported or were given by the agents, they were not comps. And and it kind of showed a little bit of naivete on the, the part of the agents. Definitely. I mean, I got two things here. The first thing goes with exactly what you were saying is when that agent um, is utilizing the comps that they believe that are actual comparables, are they within a certain mile radius? Is there one that is better to use versus not? Um, was it this year? Or was it 2020? Right. Um, there's, there's just so many little nuances to the concept of that. But the biggest thing that gets me is we'll send them the appraisal. And that's typically the only time that we'll send out the appraisal to all parties is when it's short. So that, Hey, go ahead, read it, examine it and give us any kind of errors that you see, right? Because they're still human. If they messed up on the square footage, which is in my opinion, the biggest reason as to why it would be short or not. Sure. Um, and most of the time they don't read it. Why? Because they don't know how. <laughs> they, they don't actually take the time to read the appraisal, study it, understand what a comparable is, um, why they're making the adjustments. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And in this particular case, the the appraiser used uh, five comparables within 400 meters of our subject mm. as a uh, square foot within uh, within 50 feet of each, you know, wow. of all the comps. And so there was really no no justification to say this appraiser was wrong right. or to go outside the neighborhood when there were so many comparables within such a, a, a short distance of our subject property. Correct. Uh, we can't, you know, can't, you don't use another uh, a comparable in, in three neighborhoods over when there's, there's literally five on the same street. Right. Right. And that, and that, how, and why is it so difficult for us to have to articulate that and fight for that every single time, right. you know, um, in addition, and I, I mentioned the buyer's agent in this uh, little debacle, uh, conundrum when it comes about, is why are you fighting for the sellers? At the end of the day, one thing that you guys should know is that when you do or accept a VA loan, that appraisal is stuck for the property for at least four months. 
So it's not like they're going to go and put it on the market and think that they can order a brand new appraisal unless it's conventional. Hey, you want to list it for conventional or cash only? I, I think that's recently changed. Oh, is it? A couple of years. So if a, so a, a VA appraisal used to say at the top for any qualified veteran. Okay. And and that appraisal would stick with that house for a period of time. Yep. That has since changed. Now the uh, the VA has the appraiser put the specific veteran's name on the appraisal. Report. Oh wow. And if for some reason. Um, the the deal the transaction did not go through and the the, the veteran walks away uh hypothetically if another veteran came and made a new offer on that same house they would order a new appraisal really yes so it's not stuck with the case number anymore correct oh wow okay we'll have to research that but there you go guys i learned something new every day <laughs> especially from john hurd boom <laughs> Um, and the last thing that I wanted to mention on the appraisal situation is appraisers for the VA or certified uh, uh, that have their SARS, they will typically call what's considered Tidewater yep. uh, before they give you a short appraisal, which gives both agents enough time to come up with the comparable so that they can put their numbers together before they just say, hey, it's short. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah, that's the... Generally, an appraiser is going to do his research prior to going out to the property, and if he's having a hard, hard time finding comps, he might um, he might uh, reach out to the agents um, and say, "Hey guys, I'm having a hard time finding value here. Yeah, can you help me? Uh, what comps did you guys use, and and so on and so forth." So, um, and it, help us out, you know, absolutely help the appraiser out. These these are the comps I use. This is what I use to support the value. Share that with the appraiser, you know, make his job a little bit easier. Absolutely. Because if you just want to throw your hands up in the air and say, oh no, I'm not going to help this guy. Well, you might, you know, get the result. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> that you, you, get, you get out what you put in. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And the VA loan is the only one that calls Tidewater. All the others will just say, nope, it's short. Here you go. Figure it out or dispute it and pay to, to fill out the grid, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that that is very admirable. And at the same time, they're looking out for their veteran in that regard because they don't want them to lose the deal because they couldn't find the right appraisal uh, comps. Correct. Um, there could be situations where there's off-market properties that they don't have access to. And the realtor maybe has that they could provide as long as they show that it closed, okay, that makes sense. Let's yeah. let's update that value. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, a lot of good veteran uh, real estate agents, when they do their listings, they know when the appraiser is going to go out and inspect. And a lot of times, they'll put their comp sheets. That's right, right there for the appraiser to see. He said, "Hey, this is what I'm. This is what we're using That's for right. comps, and and and." you know, use it if you want, if not, you know, okay. But, but yeah, I think, you know, that's a sign of a good professional realtor that, uh, that will do a comp sheet for an uh, appraiser when he comes out. I agree. I agree. Uh, and, and I've heard uh, this a couple of times that, uh, don't you think that that's unethical for the, the realtor to put the comps there for the, okay. Tell me how that's unethical. If the appraiser already has the purchase contract and knows the amount that they're trying to hit. I right. mean, essentially if they went into it blindly, who knows what, what they would get as far as value value is, uh, what's that word, uh, that I do not like, uh, JC, uh, it is subjective. subjective. <laughs> I can't stand that word. <laughs> Anywho, okay, let's move on. Um, we are here. Let's see. Take longer. Okay, VA loans are only for buying a home. Myth or true? Myth. Okay, why is that? You can refinance a VA loan. They okay. have uh, what's called a EARL or interest rate reduction loan. Okay. Um, you can, or which is a no credit qualifying. Mm -hmm. As long as you've made your mortgage payment on time for the last twelve months, mm -hmm. we don't have to verify income. We don't have to verify assets. We can lower the rate and and get that veteran into a lower payment. Absolutely. Um, there is a full credit qualifying yep. VA loan for people who might have been in a conventional loan for uh, a period of time, right. and they want to say, you know what, I want to use my VA benefit and switch this into a VA loan and mm -hmm. lower the interest rate. Absolutely. Now, are you going to do a full credit qualify? Yes. Um, but you can go from a conventional and refinance it into a VA loan. That's right. And and then is uh, the EARL is something that I have been educating a lot of veterans on lately, just because of rates being where they are. I'm not going to say they're high rates, um, but they're where they're at now, uh, deemed by the market, um, essentially letting them know that, hey, once, as long as you're okay with this payment that we're at right now, it can only get better. I'm not saying that rates are going to come down for sure. I guarantee my crystal ball says exactly this time. 
Who knows, right? Nobody knows. But when they do, it's a lot less of a challenge for a veteran to tackle a refinance um, than it is for anybody else. Because just like you said, no appraisal, uh, as long as you're making your payments on time for the last 12 months, and as long as there is a tangible benefit for that borrower, slam dunk. Absolutely. You don't even need an appraisal. No appraisal. And we do what's called a mortgage only credit pull. There you go. So we're only pulling the mortgage history on the credit report, nothing else. We're not going to see the credit cards or student loans or auto loans. We're going to see none of that. We're right. going to see a credit score and the mortgage payment history. And that's it. That's right. I mean, those are beautiful scenarios for our veterans that, um, gosh, it's just more work and more trouble for them to keep up with that because we're talking about, I don't know what the statistic is, but I'm sure half of them have some type of disability from serving and, this is not their lane. This is not what they do for a living. They're not financial gurus. Um, so they rely and depend on folks like you and I to help guide them through this process. And when you're going through a refinance, it can be pretty daunting uh, for the most part. But if you're going through an Earl, it's like, sit back, relax. We got this. Exactly. Yeah. It, no income on the application, no assets on the application. It's just a no credit qualifying. You, you've made your payments on time and we can lower your rate a certain amount. Now, the VA is going to uh, stipulate that we're not going to lower you from a six and a half to a 6.3, right? right? Because there's not enough uh, financial benefit. That's right. So there's still cost associated with the refinance, um, you know, setting up a new escrow account, title policy, things of that nature. That's right. And so it, there's got to be a benefit to the veteran. You got to be lowering the the interest rate a certain amount or making the payment be reduced by a certain amount. That's it, right. It can't just be a refinance just to refinance. Yeah, and that that's a beautiful thing right there. That is a, a, a precautionary measure that is put in place so that loan officers can't take advantage of veterans that don't know any better. Right. You can't close on a VA Earl unless there is a tangible benefit to you as the borrower. Correct. S yeah. Simple. Yeah. I love that. Um, okay. So let's see here. We already talked about appraisals. We skipped a couple of these things when we went off on our tangent. I love it. Um, okay. Here's a good one. You can get a VA loan with no money down. True. True. Yeah. Is it possible every time? Trying to think of a situation where it's not possible. Maybe How about no using, closing cost. You're using your bonus entitlement. Well, closing cost is different from down payment. That's what I wanted to touch on <laughs> because a lot of folks, uh, will put on social media. And uh, matter of fact, John Hudson and I talk about this a lot mm -hmm. in these uh, discussions. It's the misguided marketing, the, the, the intactical marketing that people put out there, which is uh, use your VA loan and won't pay any money out of pocket. Well, that's not always the case because if you as the realtor don't get them closing cost, the Lender's not going to pay all of their closing costs for them. Right. Um, and if that is the case, it'll be in the rate some way, shape, or form. Right. So when people believe that there's zero money down, matter of fact, I had it uh, probably a week ago. Uh, we were going over the, they just received um, uh, a contract and I was the second lender. And essentially they said, well, I thought I, I didn't need to pay any money out of pocket. And I'm like, well, was it discussed with your agent that you needed closing costs, things of this nature? Right. Luckily, we were able to raise the sales price, get them closing costs, and get it to where it should have been from day one. But the idea that a VA loan requires zero money is a myth to a certain extent. Do you have to put money down? No. But you're going to have closing costs. Well, a seller's going to want you to put at least a, uh, earnest money down. There right? you go. Yes, sir. So that's something, right? Yep. Even if the closing costs are being paid for by the seller or another party, mm -hmm. um, you still have to put that earnest money down. Now you may get it back. Right. Um, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people involved in a mortgage, right? There's a title company, there's a, appraisers, there's surveyors, and unfortunately, they don't like to work for free. Yeah. Um, and so the the costs associated with a VA loan are very similar to that of other financing. That's right. Um, and, and they're required. Uh, lenders are required to have title insurance. That's right. Um, they're required to have an appraisal most times. Right. Uh, most times, not all the time. Uh, they're you know required to see a survey or sur the the title company will require a survey to insure yeah. the title. Um, and, and th that's just the, the cost of, of obtaining financing. It's true. It's true. The cost of getting money, you know, <laughs> uh, it's funny. I have a lot of times people will say, um, when I'm talking to them, I request all the documents up front, uh, and all the loan officers here do the same thing. 
Uh, a matter of fact, before we even meet with them via Zoom to give them their options, and uh, a lot of times they will uh, say, well, why are you asking me for so much? And my instant response, and, and it's intended to get them to laugh, I say, why are you asking me for so much money? <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh yeah, okay, I get it, I get it. They laugh and then we go on about it. But I explain to them that you're asking a substantial amount of funds uh, with no money down right now on your VA loan. So therefore, I've got to make sure that you can pay this back. I've got to make sure that you're stable. Um, matter of fact, you're at a 580 credit score. So just making sure <laughs> everything lines up. You know, I know absolutely. And and a, a thing that you and I hear a lot lately is about the interest rates, right? Yeah. And and you said something earlier in the in the show. The it's all relative. Yes. And so people are not liking the fact that they have to pay you know, six and a half percent or whatever the case may be to, sure. bar to borrow money, but they're not complaining when you can get 6% on a CD mm. or getting in a high, a high yield checking account at 2%, which was unheard of. Oh my goodness. For a Literally. long time. Yeah. And with the Dow uh, hitting what almost or 40,000 this year, Correct. they're not complaining when they're seeing their 401k balances. Very rise. true. It's very true. You don't get any of that when interest rates are at, at 2.75, 3%. That's true. So, and and it, it is a um, balance. That's, that's exactly right. And, and folks believe that rates are up um, because somebody wants to punish them or something like that. And that's just not the case. That's literally the only lever that can be pulled in order to slow down inflation to our knowledge thus far. Uh, policies, of course, those can change. Uh, presidents, those can change, but we, we do what we do <laughs> with what we got. <laughs> yeah. The, with a, in an inflationary market, um, bond prices are going to suffer because bonds are debt instruments. So these, these big invest institutional investors, they, they sell off bonds, which is debt to, to raise money, to buy more mortgages. That's right. And, and when, when the dollar is worth less via inflation, mm -hmm that bond is going to be worth less unless they raise the interest rate. That's right. They got to, they got to keep attracting buyers of their bonds so they can buy mortgages. But if that, if they have to keep paying their, the bonds or the, the price of the bonds go up, that's right. Interest rates have to go up. That's exactly right. So that was very well uh, articulated there. You must, you, <laughs> I th I think, you must know your options in trading. <laughs> I, I think I messed all that up. But no, that was good. <laughs> do, do you still dabble at all or do you dabble at all? I know during COVID 2020 through 2022, I made and lost my ass all in the same uh, breath of fresh air. Uh, it was like, yeah, let's go crypto. Let's go Six Flags and then sell Six Flags. Shit, I lost over here in crypto. <laughs> uh, I don't dabble too much. I, you know, we, you know, try to max out a 401k and then, you know, I give a little bit of money to another institution for an IRA and, okay. and just, you know, let them conservative. I'm, I'm pretty conservative in that regard. I, I did want to get into crypto a little bit. I'm kind of glad I did. I'm glad you didn't too. Man. <laughs> it's it, it was a fun ride and it was cool to see certain things happen as quickly as they did because it, it, that was unheard of with any kind of stock, to be honest. And was it a stock kind of not really only on uh what is it called? Uh, 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 what was that? The thing that I used, uh, Robin hood. Oh yes. Oh my God. It was just too easy. Like oh, swipe done. I just bought a whole bunch of them. Boop. Just sold a whole <laughs> bunch of them. And then I get from the IRS, like you made $270,000. I'm like, no, I didn't. Did you guys not put the baseline? <laughs> <laughs> so we got to put an amendment in for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's, that's interesting stuff. And it's cool to tie the market to mortgages and how they can relate on the back end, because a lot of folks don't understand that they are, um, totally tied together. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, mortgages are traded on the secondary market like stocks or, you know, a commodity or, right. or, or you know, any uh, bonds. So um, their prices can fluctuate daily. And sometimes uh, clients will get frustrated because they're looking at a house, uh, you know, one day and on a Monday and then, and you, you quote them an interest rate and they don't maybe contract until Thursday. Well, that, that rate might have changed an eighth of a point or a quarter of a point. That's right. And, uh, and, and they're like, well, you told me this. I'm like, well, you know, just like the stock market goes up and down every day, the bond market, you know, also can change every day. That's right. And that affects the, uh, certainly affects the interest rate. A hundred percent great uh, way to put that. Uh, and it allows me to say the following. For those of you out there, first time buyers, second time buyers, don't care how many times you bought a home before. If you're out there shopping for mortgage rates before you're actually under contract, you're doing yourself a total disservice. Why? 
because you can't lock it in until you're actually under contract. The idea behind locking in an interest rate for a certain amount of time is you are reserving X amount of funds under whoever investor is going to purchase those funds. Um, there's penalties if you break that lock. There are penalties um, for uh, going over the allotted time that you have locked this period. So the idea of shopping, I know when you go to real estate school, they, they tell you to tell your customers, make sure that they shop for interest rates. And then you've got big banks, Wells Fargo Chase that say, shop for your mortgage rates. No problem. But wait till you're under contract so you're not spinning your wheels. Come to find out that 5% rate that they gave you miraculously went up to 7% in the last two days. No, they knew that you couldn't lock it. So they got you to send their documents and everything else. And now all of a sudden you're stuck with the bag, you know? Yeah, it's true. Okay. JC, how are we doing on time? Okay. We're, we're, we're almost there. Let's do a couple more of these. And then I want to talk about today's market with you. Sure. What the hell's going on? Um, let's see here. VA loans have hidden fees. What? Depending on you look at hidden fees. Okay. There might be a, there might be a couple fees that are not required on a conventional loan, mm -hmm. i.e. termite. Mm -hmm. Right. Conventional loan does not require a termite inspection. The VA does. Right. Uh, but we're talking about a hundred dollar fee here to right. send a, uh, an inspector out there to go inspect for wood destroying insects. Um, you know, it's pretty easy, pretty standard. And a lot of agents even do this on their conventional inspections as well. That's right. Um, and so is it a hidden fee? I wouldn't say it's hidden. Um, is it an additional to what conventional requires? Maybe. Right. So matter of fact, let's, let's replace hidden with additional fees right to make that a true statement simply because nothing is hidden when you're buying a, a house and using a mortgage to do so we are heavily regulated we've got to disclose and then disclose and then disclose um so nothing in the regard is hidden matter of fact we have to disclose fees that may or may not even be charged in the end it's just if we don't disclose them and it happens to need to be charged we're going to have to eat that if we didn't disclose it up front. Correct. You know, and again, we're not in the business of giving away money. <laughs> I'm trying to think of another fee that, that might be required by the VA. That's not required by uh, other loan programs, but that's the first one that comes to mind. Um, yeah. I mean, example, uh, if someone's using a text vet, uh, loan, there is a 1% participation fee and the lenders can charge a 1% origination. Correct. Uh, but again, they're disclosed. These are things that you as the consumer, you as the realtor should be talking to your lender beforehand to go over how much closing costs is it going to take to get this deal done? Um, why? So that I can possibly get some from the sellers um, in that regard mm -hmm. and have the expectations, just like John said in the beginning, over uh, under promise, over deliver every single time. Absolutely. Yeah. And you have happy clients. Absolutely. Repeat clients. Re yes. That's how you build your <laughs> empire, you Absolutely. know, with people that uh, know that you're all about staying on, on, on the up and up with everything. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. I'm going to find one last one. Um, do VA loans are the last resort. I don't even like that. Uh, do, 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 do. VA loans are more expensive in the long run. That is a, that is a, uh, right on the line of could be, but couldn't be. You want to talk about it for a bit? Sure. Um, so generally when you're looking at which is more expensive, you got to look at the interest rate, mm -hmm. uh, and the, you know, and the closing cost. That's right. And so the closing cost and the interest rate and generally can, can be reflected in the APR, but Correct. the APR is only for what the first five years. Correct. Um, uh, most mortgages in this day and age are not made to term, meaning you get a 30 year mortgage, you pay back only what you're supposed to pay every month for 30 years. I, right. I think the average life expectancy now is what, eight, nine, five years? to eight. Yep. Okay. Um, and so does a VA charge what's called a funding fee, right? And and that's that's basically a fee to keep the program going. That's right. Um, a lot of veterans are exempt from it because they have at least a 10% disability rating or greater. That's right. Um, and so you just kind of have to do the math, work it out on an amortization table. You know, you say, okay, a conventional rate at 6.75 6 and a VA versus six, at 6.5%. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the total cost of interest over the life of the loan and, you know, is the difference going to exceed that funding fee? If not, right. then they're not more expensive. Oh, that's perfect. And, and there's one thing that 
definitely from a monthly payment standpoint that stands out to me on a VA loan that is not the same on any other program, um, especially compared to the amount of funds or lack of funds that you're putting down, which is the mortgage insurance. VA right. loans do not have mortgage insurance related. Right. Um, they do have the upfront funding fee if you're not more than 10% disabled or more. Right. Um, but try that with an FHA loan, try that with a conventional loan, try that with a USDA loan. They've all got some bit of upfront or monthly mortgage insurance, private both. mortgage or both. That's yeah. right. Um, so the idea of a VA loan being more expensive in the long run, I think it is also relative. You've got to look at the big picture, not just um, comparing apples to oranges in that aspect. Right. And it, we've had a 20 year war in Afghanistan mm. that ended, you know, a couple years ago. And so we have a lot of veterans and a, a lot of them have disability ratings. Mm. And, and I would say most, um, I would say out of 10 VA loans that I do, nine will have a disability rating yeah. of 10% or higher. And I think that's uh, probably why the VA funding fee has increased. Right? Yeah, that makes because sense. So many, we are at war for so long and so many people were injured and they're coming back and now they want to use their benefits. And so uh, they weren't getting the funding that they needed to support the, the program. Man, I, I've never <laughs> thought about it that way or even in that perspective. You just made me take a bird's eye view and go, oh, okay, that does make great <laughs> sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have been at war. There's plenty of veterans that have since retired, um, been awarded their benefits. And like you said, because most of the VA loans that I do, same thing, they have some at least 10%. Right. Now, mind you, if you're a hundred percent veteran, you don't pay any property taxes and that's nice. That's very nice. You know, yeah. uh, I've got my neighbor, uh, next door, hundred percent veteran. Mm -hmm. I mean, we pay $30,000 a year in, in property taxes alone. And I'm like, dude, do you want to adopt a grown man? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Okay. So we were able to go through quite a bit of myths and misnomers that the VA loan itself have. Um, and I'm glad I got to have that conversation with you because you knew, you know, your shit, you know, and I think that the people out there, um, listening, viewing, want to be told the truth, not some sugar-coated salesman act. And that's not what we got here today. Uh, and I definitely appreciate that. Yeah. Everything, most of what we talked about wasn't very opinionated. It was total facts. Uh, and then giving our perspective on it. Right. Let's talk about some opinions. What the hell's going on with the market today? What are you seeing out there? Within the last couple of weeks, what I'm seeing is... Bad news is bad news and good news is good news. Um, I like so that. for a long time, you know, when you, we, we would see news, uh, financial news that would hit the market and generally that would actually help interest rates. It didn't help them. Right. Or we would see, you know, news that would hurt interest rates. It, it, it didn't hurt them. Um, <clears throat> The, the Fed last year, toward the tail end of last year in December, said they were going to make, what, about three or four rate cuts. Right. Uh, that was in December. And then in January, yeah. they, they basically said, well, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's right. <laughs> they said, well, we maybe jumped the gun a little bit on that. <laughs> yeah, whoops. And then we got to February and March, and it's like, okay, well, we'll be lucky that we don't raise them again. <laughs> Insert foot into mouth. <laughs> That's right. Um, but, but in the last couple of weeks, there, there's been some economic data to support this economy is slowing, right? Okay. Uh, the jobs number came out today and it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, uh, didn't meet expectations, right. which is, which is good for interest rates. Is it for good sure. for the people that lost their jobs? Absolutely not. Right. But, but it, it is good for, for borrowing purposes. And so what we're, what I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to make a projection that the Fed will do one rate cut this year. Um, my guess will be maybe September timeframe or some, somewhere along those lines. Yeah. Um, that will help. The market's kind of already priced that in. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we'll kind of see, but, but I think that we're heading to a, a place where rates are going to dip a little bit. It might not be this year. It might be, you know, 2025. There's a little anxiety about the election and stuff like that. Sure. You know, that, that always has, you know, traders mm -hmm. uh, anxious on, on who's, which outcome that's going to go. Or traders and go. traders. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, you're, you're right in that. Uh, um, the, the, I guess I, I picked the same concept. I, th I thought there was going to be a, a, at least one rate cut, uh, prior to the election. And that is hopefully, um, not due to political reasons. And it is due to, to helping people get into homes based on the economy and what's going on. 
Um, I, I mean, obviously there is, um, a lot of unknown, uh, for the next several months that we're going into. But one thing that I have to kind of hang my hat on is that we live in Texas and real estate is always local. And what I mean by that is our values historically have withstood the, the, the testament of time. Taking a snapshot back, we've at least got a year over year, 5% or so increase in our value. Right. Uh, over the last several years, it's gone to 30%. Uh, now, when we see prices dropping, I don't think that people are taking that the right way. Values are dropping. Are values dropping or are they adjusting to what they should be based on these higher than normal, higher than average list prices? Right. You know what I mean? Or, or you know, during 20, 21 and you know, 2020, 2021, yeah. when, when home prices skyrocketed 20% and now they're making a 5%, a 5% correction, like, well, did you lose money? N no, you didn't. You know, right. You still, you know, still realize that appreciation. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but we haven't seen a lot of uh, values go down per se. Um, you know, Texas has insulated itself with the bar. You know, they have pretty strict uh, borrowing laws. You can't, yes. you can't pull equity more than 20% out or excuse me, you can't have a, a loan to value more than 80% if you want to pull money out. Right. Whereas like some other States, you can, you can pull cash out up to hundred percent of the value of your property. That's crazy. Um, which is really crazy. And I remember, <clears throat> you know, in the 2000 and, you know, five and six and, and all that, I, th I think California has, Californians were able to do like a hundred and uh, one percent yeah. one ten percent loan to value because their property values were going up so fast. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, some of the, the areas that we're seeing a little bit of, a, uh, or I, I've noticed a little bit of a, a slight decrease is Austin. Okay. Um, you know, because of COVID you had so many influx of, of new, new people coming in from out of state mm -hmm. in California, um, you know, up and down the West coast and East coast they're, they're moving to Texas because we had less restrictive laws, uh, because of, uh, of COVID. And so you had a tremendous influx with Tesla moving here and yeah. Hewlett Packard and a whole yeah. bunch of these big, huge companies. So the prices just shot up through the roof. And, and it was, it was very difficult for an average person to afford, you know, right. a, a, a house, you know, a, a modest house might cost $600,000 right. in, in Austin. And we're seeing a little bit of a, a correction, mm -hmm. right. That, you know, prices have, have come down just a little bit. That's right. Um, so, but in San Antonio, we, we were pretty insulated. Yeah. And I think you're on the money in regards to that. Matter of fact, a lot of the folks that were going to purchase in Austin, seeing what that market was doing and, and kind of being priced out, ended up purchasing in San Antonio in that kind of corridor there, which is what's keeping those prices not only steady, but also rising. I mean, you look at Sakine, you look at New Braunfels, that area is consistently increasing in value. I'm, I'm still seeing multiple offers if they're listed properly. Right. Um, so those of you that live in Austin, have no fear. I don't think that the bottom is going to fall out because number one, we still have plenty of people from California, New York, uh, Washington that are coming here. Uh, matter of fact, out of the country coming here, they're paying cash for stuff. Um, but the good news on real estate is as long as you hold the real estate or as long as you can hold the real estate, you'll get your money back. Um, and I don't think we're in a situation to where um, we're even close to being upside down in a home substantially to where uh, you've got no choice. Um, right. Now, Austin was one of the ones where I did for the first time ever see somebody go like $200,000 over and get excited when it was only 100000 short on the appraisal. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so you're going to put a hundred grand cash. Bye-bye. Cool. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah, today's market. I mean, we all make qualified mortgages, right? Yeah, and so we we verify the income, we verify you know where the assets uh, mm -hmm. are coming from, and and we verify the value one way and uh, one way or another. So, um, you know, when the the crash back in you know oh eight oh nine. Uh, you, if you could fog a mirror, you can get a mortgage. That's right. All you needed was a 700 credit score and state your income, and then you got a mortgage with, right. with no down payment. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. And so, of, of course, when, um, you know, that's going to send prices up across the country and something's got to give. Right? That's right. And when those mortgages started defaulting, 
that was the, that was the breaking point. That's definitely how it went down. Um, yeah. Even though I wasn't in the industry then, um, I was still in the um, financial world. I was a banker, business banker for Chase. Seeing it, I, I mean, didn't really know exactly what was going on because uh, I hadn't delved into that uh, that sector all the way yet. But man, it was like holy cow that that's happening. Yeah. I'm glad we put the regulations in place, and I I'm glad there's people like you uh, still around doing what you do best. You know, <laughs> it's true. Well, thanks, Mark. Absolutely. Well, yes, well. Um, John, is there anything that you'd like to let our listeners know? I mean, this is your time now. If you want to let them know anything, by all means, the floor is yours because then I want to read one of these cards. <laughs> the, the only thing I could think of is, is you asked me a question at the very beginning is like, can a uh, non-veteran get a mortgage? Yeah. And a VA loan. And we discussed the uh, spouse or, uh, Correct. or, or surviving spouse. Um, technically, if if I was not married and my sister and I wanted to buy a house together, mm -hmm. she can be on a VA loan and we're not married. Mm. Now the VA says she would, will have to put down twelve and a half percent, but she will still be on a VA mortgage. Boom! That because the VA guarantees twenty five percent, but only half of us are veterans and we're not a spouse, and so we'll say okay, there's only one, so we'll do twelve and a half percent. You know what? You're a hundred percent right. And I think that's only come out one time in my entire career, but that is accurate as all can be. Wow. But still no mortgage insurance. That's right. And still get the lower rate. That's exactly right. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, uh, you heard it here, guys. You may have to run that back to make sure that you understand what he just said, but it is totally possible. Holy cow. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Wow. You don't see it very often. No, you don't, but it's still there. Absolutely. And that's what's important. Um, the other thing that's important is that you guys out there are still tuning in. Um, and I'm really hoping that you got something out of this uh, VA discussion or learn something about John Hurd and his team. Um, but uh, we are going to continue to give you guys good discussions, uh, transparent, honest, upfront um, from those that have integrity and are willing to share uh, their experiences and their values with you guys. Um, so as always, John, thank you for joining me today. Uh, pretty good job on a first podcast, brother. Thanks for having me. Man. Absolutely. Good happy, happy early birthday. Happy birthday to you, brother. Boom. Uh, guys, we will catch you on the next one.